Hello everyone, it is Caitlin and today we are making a later 1860s morning dress. Let's go ahead and start on this dress. So, uh, we're doing a very period activity today of taking apart an older, earlier dress and making it into a newfangled, um, fashionable gown. As fashionable as first morning can be. So the whole story behind this morning gown is, morning is never something I really wanted to do. I'm interested in, this, in the whole morning situation. However, it's just not something that I ever had occasion, thankfully, to portray. Um, whether it's in my personal life or a character I'm portraying. But Van Thorpe Inn in um, October is doing um, morning customs throughout the time period, or at least the 18, 1867 exactly, because that's when the proprietor of the inn, um, Mr. Van Thorpe, passed away on Halloween. So, kind of worked out perfectly. Halloween, morning, death, you know, full morning is going to be required. And so today I think we're just going to work on the gown, but I have this earlier 1860s dress that I made, oh gosh, six years ago. Um, it's a lovely black wool dress. I managed to get it for like $8 a yard on Amazon of all places, which is very strange. But I made it up into like an 1860, 1861 gown. And so here we are with our 1860, 1861 gown. About five years ago, I got the cat, Alara, which y'all have seen on video. Of course, the shelter gave her to me unspayed, but with the understanding that I would get her spayed. And during one of her little heat cycles, she peed all over the dress. So it smelled like cat pee for a really long time. So it has now been in the garage for five years, and I have not touched it, so I haven't worn it. And you can see there's dust all over it because it's been in the garage for five years. I got it out, I don't smell cat pee anymore, so maybe it was just... Maybe I just had to uh, wait it out for a while. Anyway, we're going to need to take off the trim because right now there's this um, silk fringe. And let's see. Earlier, I can see the gown. We we'll probably need to gore the skirt, so we're going to take it, the skirt apart entirely. Gore the skirt. Make sure there's a pocket in there. Here she comes smelling it. Yeah, because of you. It was in the garage for five years because of you. And then we're going to need to take it off the waistband. There are two bodices, I think. I think, And I know there's one bodice. And I think the other one is made up. I just never, um, or cut out, I just never made it up. So, yeah, let's go ahead and get taking this apart. I am hoping that the skirt is long enough to go over my elliptical situation uh, hoop that I have. Why is this on a silk waistband? Five years ago, I didn't know nearly the stuff I know now. So this is a very period activity, taking gowns that are older and remaking them to be fashionable. And you wouldn't do this just for morning. This was a normal activity. Okay, I don't want this whole video to be me I'm picking a skirt, so I'm going to go sit and watch TV while I do this, and I will see you with a completely unpicked skirt, and I'll probably clean it all off because it's kind of gross. I don't know if I want to soak it or if I want to spot clean. Alright, I'm here to try and get this pattern put out together, so I took apart the bodice, and I think you'll need to see that because you all saw me take, taking apart a lot of the skirt, and I didn't want this whole video to be taking me taking apart things. So, um, here we go. This is the back of the bodice, and this is my current pattern. There are some changes. Um, for some reason, well, I guess this shoulder seam is probably far, too far up. So, I cut, so my actual bodice piece now is much more further back. I'm going to put a waistband on it, so I don't need this inch and a half here. And it's somewhat shaped differently. This one I didn't have to piece because it's actually smaller than uh, my piece five years ago, which is interesting because I'm bigger than I was five years ago. So interesting, but that worked out. I'm going to cut that out. Front piece worked out fairly well. I'm going to have to trim this up. 
I thought about actually piecing that and then realized, you know what? First of all, it's going to make this very bulky because I had to put piping and a sleeve in here. And also, the shoulder seam is gradually going up. So there's almost meeting your shoulder in the 1870s. And we're almost 1870s. So there's no reason this should be dropped as much as it is in the early 1860s, which is what this pattern is. So I'm actually going to leave that the way it is and cut a little bit off the back as well, uh, about three quarters of an inch, to make it further up my arm. I am, however, going to piece this because that is just, that's about two and a half, that's about two inches and that's just too much. So I'm going to take that out. I have here a piece of the Pellerine and some more brown cotton that's going to be lining. I'm just going to sew this together. There's two pieces here. There's the right side and the left side. So we're just going to do this side for right now. So I'm going to sew this piece and then um, use the same Pellerine because there's plenty of it to do this other side. And then I can cut off the whole bodice piece and have the bodice done. I have two bodices and I'm really hoping I can get um, the coat sleeves out of the one. I guess they're Gigo sleeves. But they're really big. But that's Pellerine. Here's a part of the coloring. I think I can get at least part of the coat sleeve from this. I may have to piece the underside, but I think we'll be able to do it and not have to use any extra fabric. I have a little bit of extra fabric, but I used to cut out a jacket that I don't even remember doing that, but apparently I did. And if I can get a jacket as well as a dress, I'd rather keep it that way. So I'd rather not use the pieces I cut out for a jacket to piece this. I want to use the pieces I already have. So if you're ever redoing a dress, that's basically what you do. You take the whole thing apart, start from scratch, where you just have patterns, or you just have the fabric. Granted, it's in odd pieces, but you just have the fabric. And then you just cut, put your, put your pattern on top of it, piece out where you need to, you know, grow a little bit, and then cut away the things you need to subtract. It's very simple. And they did it all the time. I have so many originals that have piecing and um, were obviously remade. And so we're going to do some of that today. All right, this project's going to be lots of fun because it's black on black on black. So I apologize if y'all can't see a lot of what I'm doing, but I am going to describe it. So hopefully that'll be enough. I was going to do the waistband next and then realized I have new corset and I need to remeasure darts. But I had to go somewhere in like an hour, and I don't feel like putting on a corset and doing all that just yet. I'm going to wait till I get back. What I am going to do is bind the neckline, because this is a late 1860s dress. We don't do a lot of piping on necklines anymore. We mostly bind them, or at least my originals are all bound. And I just luckily had some binding where I bound the Pellerine last time. So I have plenty of, I was going to use it to make piping but it's already ready for binding. If you're wondering what happened to the skirt, it is still soaking in hydrogen peroxide to try to get the rest of the cat piece mellow. I'm gonna do that quarter inch on the edge and we'll turn it back under with the other end. All right, I'm stitching on the binding. Just little tiny whip stitches. Go ahead and put on the hooks and eyes on the bodice. Obviously, I have to put them on the waistband yet because we don't have a waistband. Binding, that looks fine. Let's see, how far apart do I want hooks and eyes? Okay. Let's start about an inch up. And we're just going to put them every inch. Why not? I am going to need to put closures all the way up because I will not be wearing any type of jewelry for the first few months of mourning. Whereas usually I'd have the top part closed with a brooch. I won't have that option. And of course, morning practice is varied from region to region, from year to year. So there's no, some people didn't even, you know, wear mourning when a loved one passed. And there was a letter I read probably eight years ago um, from the Civil War, I believe. And I don't remember exactly, so take this with a grain of salt. But... It was um, a wife had written to her husband saying that her mother was about to pass away. And her husband wrote back basically saying um, when she dies, don't wear mourning because you look horrible in black. 
which I thought was very inconsiderate. And here are the sleeves. I know I'm going to be going out of order for this gown, but this is what we're doing. This is the old sleeve, which was basically a modified gigo. And then I used the back of the pelerine to kind of piece this out. And this is my smallest coat sleeve, which would have been popular in 67. Make sure the buttonholes didn't make it into the new sleeve. All right, we're gonna sew the sleeves. sleeves and now they're sewn together. I was going to put a facing on them but then I realized the sleeves are an inch and a half too long so I figured just fold it under an inch and then another or fold it under half an inch and then another inch and that takes care of that. And we'll just whip that um, down. So it's kind of like a facing an attached facing. And then on the bodice I'm almost ready to try it on but I need to finish these eyes first. So I did the typical, uh, I think we did this last couple dresses, but sew them into the lining and then we're just whipping the lining to the fashion fabric. I also managed to piece a waistband so I have one of those. I just need to cut a lining for it. For it. Alright I tried it on, put darts in. So now we're going to put boning on the darts. I think they'll go up all the way. Right here. We're using German plastic whalebone. I will just stitch that in in a moment. And I have here the waist sand. Quite a bit of this over. I'm not sure how much of that I want that to turn over. But I want a little bit of it to turn over, so we're going to leave it there. And while we're here, we might as well sew on the piping the bottom of the waistband too. Alright, so working on this piping. I also cut out the skirt. Um, I was avoiding it normally. If, you, if you've been on the channel long, you know I usually do the skirts first in my construction. Um, it doesn't really matter whichever way. That's just what I usually do. The skirt on this one was kind of, I was avoiding it because by 1867 we are definitely into gourd skirts. And I really don't like doing gourd skirts. I could not find my gourd skirt pattern that I have. And I didn't feel, feel like buying a new one because I knew I had that one. So I had to draft it, which I did. I think it'll fit. And this is unraveling and irritating me. So I'm just going to overcast all these raw edges, at least in the waistband. The, this, the bodice doesn't seem to be unraveling very, very much, but the waistband, definitely so. And here's the sleeve. We're just doing a, okay, rather large back stitch. As long as it holds it in, we're good. It's a lot of layers to get through. But after this, uh, I need to put hooks and eyes on the waistband. And then after that, it's just trimming. All right, I did not show the cutting of the skirt, so we're gonna cut a pocket though. Sure, why not, that can stay that way. All right, so bodice is basically done. I'm going to go ahead and cut a collar and cuff. I have decided I'm not going to trim this gown. Um, I know I had heard references to trimming dresses in crepe, but it appears that for deep mourning, that was kind of frowned upon. I found some uh, stories where ridiculous characters who are in mourning often profusely trim their gowns um, in crepe. So it, it came across as this is not something that polite people do. So I'm going to not trim it. And if I come across references that change that, then eventually I can trim it. I'm going to go ahead and cut the collar. And this is silk crepe. It's not great compared to the originals. Actually, I, need, I forgot to add some lines over here. Glad I remember that. It's not perfect. It's, it is silk crepe. It has the texture to it, which is awesome. It's black. 
it's a little bit heavier than the original and it's a little more drapey which I think has to do with the weight it's not as crisp as I have one original let me go get it it's later than our time period but I have this original probably 1870s 1880s uh, morning bonnet that's you know, entirely covered in crepe and then has its veil steel which will probably copy this mostly for the veil because well that makes sense so the modern reproduction is definitely a lot more opaque than this so this is gonna be a little bit harder to see through which is gonna be a lot of fun but um, regardless of that um, it's just stiffer than the reproduction stuff or the stuff that I have but here's the collar I'm gonna go ahead and do a narrow hem all the way around finish it off and we also need to cut some cuffs and here's the cuff I just took the sleeve pattern copied it off and then sloped it because I kind of wanted a gradual slope on it. Um, both, this cuff, both the top and the bottom cuffs are exactly the same. So I'm just cutting four of them. So I am going to sew these on together and then I'm going to hand do the hem I believe um, just right up here. Uh, same thing I'm doing with the collar. Alright, skirt. Uh, I took a break from all the hand stitching of the crepe and we're here with the skirt so I just what I ended up doing is I looked at a lot of late 1860s originals I'm seeing really big box pleats particularly a massive one in the center front um, and then some gauging in the back to really get that fullness you know really tight but a lot of fullness um, in the center back where the you know majority of the skirts gonna sit so the center front panel is now a six inch box pleat that is um, taken up It's a double box pleat. So there's two pieces underneath here and that's the whole center front panel. It's just this little section. Then I did three somewhat smaller box pleats on either side. So these are three inch box pleats with six inches underneath. So it's like two thirds of it is pleat and one third of it is you know, showing on the outside. And this little extra I have here is going to get gauged so it'll nicely fit over that elliptical hoop. So I'm going to get it pinned. I'm going to get all this um, gauged up, make sure it matches my waist measurement, and I'm going to put it on over the crinoline just to make sure everything sits right. All right, here we are attaching the waistband to the bodice, or sorry, the waistband to the skirt. Making sure I go through all the pleat layers. Also, make sure that the center that the center front of the large plate hits the center front of the gown itself. All right, I was nearly finished with the collars and cuffs, and realized that I forgot to finish the facing. So we're gonna do that very quickly. And so the dress is done, um, and as it is, it's not a morning dress, it's just a black dress. Perfectly serviceable for really anything I want to wear it to, except for, you know, morning. So we're going to fix that. Here's the collar that I made. A very narrow little thing. Now we're stitching the collar in uh, with loose whip stitches, just like we would a normal collar. Alright, now we have a cuff to put in. We're gonna, we're gonna finish the cuff first because I haven't quite finished it. But it's basically a narrow hem, so it's a quarter of an inch that I turned under. And then I'm taking the stitch um, right below where the raw edge is and then where the fold is. And when I pull it all up, it folds the whole seam in half so I get like an eighth inch seam. It's a very narrow hem. 
And this is the last step for the gown. So we'll probably put it on right after I finish stitching this on. Try it on, see how it fits. Here we are, um, all dressed up, uh, at least somewhat, kind of mix and match pieces today. I couldn't find an 1860s chemise, so I'm in an 1870s chemise um, with my 1860s corset and at least the correct hoop and um, petticoat. Although I'm looking at this petticoat and I need to hem it because it is quite long. I guess I did meant to wear it with the ones with the slight heels, but even then it is a very long petticoat, so I'm going to have to take like three inches off. Glad we did this before the event. But let's go ahead and try on the dress. Okay. Might want to tack the cuffs on because they are falling down. Probably go over it with a lint roller because there's cat hair everywhere. You can't see down here, so I'm really just doing this by feel. There we go. I think I got one. some sort of situation because that shows through. Okay, it might just be a matter of turning it to the back just slightly. All right, that isn't so bad. Is this all the way out? It's a tiny little collar. It's going to be hard to keep it out, but there we are. That is a morning dress um, and very easily changed into a non-morning dress, which is taking out these and this. So, I think we did an excellent job. It's um, maybe slightly dragging on as a train on the back, but for 1867, that's not a bad thing. There we go. I definitely will need to hem the petticoat a little bit though, but it's not showing anywhere. Maybe about an inch shorter than the skirts, maybe. Maybe not even the three inches I thought. Maybe just, I'll figure out what that is later. Um, maybe just like an inch or something. So let me turn it down so you can kind of see. Ignore the craziness of the sewing room. But there it is. I mean, I, the one thing I really do like about this time period is the very flat front. I actually really do like that. And I you know, honestly don't mind the shape of the later 1860s. I did not do my hair in the official late 1860 style. I just kind of did it just for today. I don't like messing with the later 1860 styles if I can't help it. So I'll just do it for the day of event and I won't worry about it today. But um, it is very elegant uh, for a morning dress for a sad occasion. Um, it is very elegant. Uh, black is generally elegant and then, I don't know, something about the black cuffs and collars. I just it's sad that you can only wear this for very sad and bummer occasions, but um, again, very easily changed into a non-morning gown. So if I just decided that I wanted a black silk dress or black wool dress for later 1860s, I have a gown. All I have to do is change these out, and that is actually that's some versatility to the wardrobe. I actually really, really like versatility in the wardrobe, so I could not be more thrilled with how this turned out. Um, I think it looks great. I'm very much looking forward to the event um, in a couple weeks. Actually, it's not even a couple weeks. It's a week and two days. It's a week and two days before I am doing this um, as Living History. So, very first time ever doing morning. So, I am just very, very thrilled we were able to do this. Yeah, the fabric's been sitting in my garage for 
it was before I moved into this house, so it was at least four years that it's been sitting out. But um, hydrogen peroxide gets cat pee out of fabric. In case you wanted to know that. I can't smell anything. And I was very sensitive to it. So even four years out in the garage, after being cleaned, it still smelled. Not anymore. So that was a good learning curve right there. But yeah, I think that's just about it. So very interesting study on remaking gowns. And I mean, and getting to use all those things that I've learned collecting originals. Learning of, oh, we don't piece up here because of this Okay.